Welcome to the show. It is great to have you with us. Alternative investments, once the domain of institutional investors like pension funds and foundations, are fast becoming a viable asset class for high net worth investors looking for diversification and investment opportunities beyond fixed income and equities. I had a chance to speak with Ted Welter, Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer for Alternative Investments at TD Greystone Asset Management about the role of alternatives in today's low yield, low interest rate investing environment. I want to start with uh, the basics. I and mean, we have a lot of people who are used to public markets and alternative investments are something, of course, people know more about. But let's start there. What are alternative investments? To give some perspective of, of, of the worthiness of alternative investments in a diversified portfolio, we'd start with the convention of the efficient frontier. So what are we trying to accomplish? When we look at a conventional stock and bond mix, we look at the expected range of outcomes, the expected returns, the volatility associated with that. When we introduce alternatives, given the nature of these private asset classes, the composition so heavily weighted to income, predictability of income and income growth, we're actually changing the composition of the efficient frontier and providing a, a higher risk adjusted return for investors to consider in a more diversified fashion. Hmm. So these private investments, and, and in the context of our products, we would be mortgages, uh, real estate, and infrastructure. They have different characteristics to provide these income streams, but all of them do foundationally come from an income-oriented thesis with growth and total returns that have an objective to perform between long-term fixed income returns and long-term equity returns. So if we accomplish what our role is, we will have a highly returning equity-ish product with a dividend-oriented return and a risk-adjusted profile that sits somewhere between stocks and bonds. Hmm. Let me, uh, we'll get into the categories. You talked about um, uh, real estate, mortgages, and infrastructure. Uh, but I want to bring up a chart uh, uh, so people can take a look just how this stuff uh, compares to everything else. And on this chart, we can see here something called expected range of outcomes. And you can see here everything from Canadian universe bonds all the way to global infrastructure. Um, the uh, yellow dots in the chart show the, the categories you're talking about. Tell me about what's interesting in this chart. You know, I'd start with, with on the right of the chart, we show what are the alternative asset classes. And the left of the public indices. So if we start with the fixed income and the Canadian uh, bond universe, mm -hmm. you know, that is a challenge we all have, the absolute return that this is providing and the prospect for that return is challenging. Uh, when we equate that to private fixed income investments, our Canadian mortgage solution by way of example, which is the first bar uh, of the alternatives, mm -hmm. there's a couple of things you can see there. One, the return is significantly higher, but the range of outcomes does not have a negative return associated with it. And let me just say this, just, just for people who are looking at this chart too, because the 2.7 you're seeing for Canadian Universe bonds, you can see it dipping below the, the line, where that 4.4 is not dipping below the line. That's what you're saying there. These are technically assumptions, but what you're looking at is a fixed income instrument that is based on a piece of dirt, a building and a aggregation of covenants slash tenants with balance sheets that we've investigated and support to pay the principal and interest promise for a period of time to a mortgage security. The reality of that defaulting through into negative is extremely hard for us to see through. So this, this notion of aggregating these private mortgage assets that provide income and that income stability and in our solution has been candidly from inception over 4% with some volatility depending on where the yield curve is, is a compelling fixed income additive solution for clients to consider. How do, let's compare the Canadian equities to uh, Canadian real estate, what's notable there? Well, I think if you look at, at those returns again, um, you know, absolute returns when we look at the two may not be that dissimilar, but look at the range of outcomes and the volatility associated with that. So again, when we look at the Canadian real estate prospect, if, if you look at, at the productivity of total returns in real estate, and, and not just Canada, but abroad, we would argue that almost 80% of the returns come from income, stability of income, and income growth. And then there's a volatility of price and capital appreciation depreciation. So, so the notion of volatility then is muted quite significantly because you have that 
reliable, you've got an aggregation of tenants in buildings paying contracted rents that are diversified over a very large port Canadian portfolio and very predictive in their outcomes. I want to pause on one thing you said there, though, is um, uh, uh, that was it 80 percent of a total return is coming from income. That's 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 a big asterisk needs to go beside that. Yeah, that, that that's a data point that that we we receive from the International Property Index um, from a Canadian perspective. We would apply that thesis to the consistency of income-oriented returns from, from our mortgage solution. And when you look at the infrastructure product and its solution, again, the long-term contracted inflation-adjusted returns, again, have this high degree of predictability of income. That 80% number relates specifically to the Canadian uh, experience of total returns for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, uh, we're going to get into the categories here in just a moment, but you have been personally, I know, managing um, and been in the alternative investment space for, for a long time. I'm not trying to age you, but I know it's, it's been a little while. How are you seeing it evolve? My roots are property management, leasing, development, um, real estate, infrastructure, the mortgage products. We're, we're service providers to the broader economy. So a couple of decades ago, we would be narrower in our assessment of the broader economy. Today, it's a global world. So in Vancouver, you are acutely sensitive to the activities in Asia, Hong Kong. You're acutely as sensitive to the activities along the tech corridor, along the West Coast, from LA uh, through Silicon, up into Seattle and into Vancouver. You know, you're acutely sensitive to the evolution of, of what is the internet and its effect on real estate. So all of these things are happening quicker, they're more diverse. Um, and, and the lens and the aperture that you assess risk is more complicated, but the data available to assess that, assess that risk has never been better. So if I tilt back 20 years ago, if we look at development activity, uh, I would suggest to you, and if people look back to some of the stories of oversupply and some of the defaults we saw in major real estate corporations 20, 30 years ago, we have institutional ownership uh, of Canadian real estate, and with that is the prudent, the discipline that comes along that. So by way of example, in construction, we use fixed price contracts. The assessment and the underwriting, the, the expected returns are measured much more carefully. Less leverage is being used, so less pressure immediately on the outcomes and, and more patience to do the right thing when you're taking on more risk. So I think, I think that there's more prudence and discipline than there was 20, 30 years ago. I think it's a more complicated world, but I think we're better equipped um, um, with data, with, with the intellectual intelligence that's been developed to execute um, and, and navigate through this, this uh, increasingly complex world. You mentioned three categories, uh, broad, I'd say asset classes, uh, private asset classes that, uh, that you guys focus on, real estate, uh, mortgages and infrastructure. Let's start with um, real estate, the biggest bucket uh, that you have right now. Can you just tell us a bit about the asset class for those who are kind of coming to this for the first time? Our conviction point on, on the product and the philosophy we have to real estate at, at, at TD Greystone is, is number one, uh, we believe these assets, uh, these private assets are owned for long periods of time, are some, in some cases in perpetuity, mm -hmm. until they're not worthy to be in a diversified portfolio. Uh, we believe that diversification is a, is a critical um, a tool for, and risk mitigator to long-term predictable returns. So then how do you accomplish that? And, and for the type of, of portfolio construction that we've embarked on and been successful in building the last 30 years, that means geography is a diversification characteristic, a property type is a diversification characteristic, and what we call risk profile. So by geography, we look from St. John's, Newfoundland to Victoria, we, we look at GDP growth, we look at population characteristics, and we have thresholds, at minimum market thresholds that we'll look to invest in. When we look at, at property type, uh, we look at, at retail, office, industrial, purpose-built uh, apartment accommodation, and the ever-evolving life of mixed-use development and urbanization-themed activity in the major markets, particularly Toronto and Vancouver. So, and then finally, we look at what we call sector, um, and for us, that, that's our core asset strategies are value added and opportunistic. Where we're somewhat unique is that all of our activities, particularly in opportunist, opportunistic and value add, is to build to core. 
We're not looking to build assets for profit and gain. We're looking to build assets that we think add to the diversification, add to the quality, add to the predictive and growing nature of income streams. Can you, so right now, if, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I think you've got over 300 properties right now in terms of in the real estate um, work that you do. Can you give us some examples of ones that, uh, uh, of your properties and why they make sense, given all that criteria you just told us? So I would say th thematically, uh, um, if we look at, and, and uh, you know, it's a national platform, but if we look at current drivers of growth, the reality is um, downtown Toronto is, is, is compelling. Downtown Toronto is compelling from population growth, from, from a D GDP perspective, um, from urbanization and, and transportation. So by way of example, at Young and Sinclair, from a core position, we've assembled the four corners of Young and Sinclair, uh, we've assembled a total of 11 buildings, and what we believe, and we bought this from a U.S. Um, investor that was, we believe, was somewhat market timing. We looked at that and said, look, the current rent roll, the current rents being paid with an aggregation st strategy and a recognition of what the subway line north, south in Toronto means, that we can reposition these assets, reinvest, enhance the tenant's experience, and grow the net operating income quite significantly. And that's playing out. So if, if you look at the density, uh, that the, the accumulation of buildings, the relationships we have with tenants, the fact we can move one tenant to another building, the fact we can grow with tenants, the fact we can serve them in that community, that's a compelling uh, core asset for the portfolio. When I say core asset, I don't mean a building. For our position, the core asset is the thesis of Young and Sinclair. So that'd be core, core plus. Then when I go down to the waterfront in, in downtown Toronto, which is one of the largest densification plays in North America, when, when we look at, at the development activity we've got going on there, that started with a land position in our opportunistic weighting. And we can only digest the risk of a land position because of the 300 properties you spoke to and the broadly diversified income streams that can hold the non-income producing development portion. That development portion has to have a development plan, development thesis with total return expectations that are accretive, but also fit into our future diversification thesis. So why do we like the waterfront? We like it because it's anchored by the LCBO, Liquor Control Board of Ontario. We like it because they've attracted other tenancy. We like it because of the retail component that's coming out of it, because we think that will be part of the heart of the waterfront of Toronto in terms of the, the tenant experience and, and the, the residential experience. And we like the fact that we can densify this site with condos and multi-tenant residential properties. Mm -hmm. That evolves into, in the years moving forward, from 20 basis points of land weight in the portfolio to what could be a three, four percent weighting of hard real estate that's producing very diverse and growing income streams in a very strategic location. Mm -hmm. We're going to have you back talk more about these, but I want to talk about all the, the pieces, but mortgages. And I remember you telling me when we talked earlier, too, that part of the reason that all this works so well is because, you know, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, your relationships that you have in real estate help you, obviously, with the mortgage market. So this is, again, I think over 100 loans and about $5 billion in, the, in, in terms of your holdings. First of all, at, at TD Greystone, and, and candidly, I would say at Greystone and now TD Greystone, one of the, one of the real uh, pleasures of upside of this transaction is at Greystone, we had the benefit of being fully integrated as an investment team. And what I mean by that is that the mortgage team works hand in glove with the real estate team. The underlying security of the mortgages is the real estate team. But in addition to that, we had the fixed income team beside us. When we look at the duration of the portfolio, where the yield curve is going and how we're assessing the risk and opportunity of the yields we expect off the mortgage portfolio. But we look at the tenancy that the mortgages are underwriting. We can go to our equity teams in, in Canada, US and global. And with TD Asset Management, that's expanded exponentially in terms of the intellectual capital we have associated with that. So when we look at our mortgage portfolio, we look at our role again as having a predictable income stream that's diversified. We do that again with the same metrics of geography and type, but the types can be different. So conventional first mortgages to second mortgages to construction mortgages, and those mortgages provide different risk and return metrics when you think about core value add and opportunistic. And together those strategies allow us to invest in assets like 
uh, the Bay Adelaide Centre, um, compelling tenancy, fully leased, the sponsor, so that's the covenant, the predictability of the income, and the sponsor owner is Brookfield, a uh, world-renowned uh, you know, uh, asset aggregator, and, and our relationship with them, and this is about people and trust and relationships, we, we have been, uh, done a lot of business with them because of the, the reliance on each other for candid uh, conversations about how we're underwriting the security on both sides of the negotiation. So th that's a sort of a core example of what we can achieve with the mortgage portfolio in our first mortgage. And to complement that for a little more value add, we look at, at what we're very interested in, in is intellectual capital. Intellectual capital is universities and young people growing in major cities. We think that, that the, the future uh, interest in, in, in corporate um, development of intellectual capital continues to be growing through the university experience. And out of that comes the requirement for student housing. So when we look at that, we look at the opportunity to do a construction loan on a developer that has a balance sheet that's interesting and as a covenant, but the security of the University of Ryerson saying will provide all of the tenancy. And as a result of that, we provided the construction financing that had a little more risk, a little more return, shorter duration against the long duration nature of the Bay Adelaide Center. And once that construction was retired, we then negotiated a term loan that moved us further down uh, the duration curve and, and the, 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 uh, the yield uh, productivity of, of uh, the asset be becoming a term loan. Last uh, uh, asset class I want to talk about is infrastructure, your smallest one that you have, I think 154 projects uh, 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 in uh, the last time I looked. The return is a whopping 19.9% over the last four years, which you can explain that. But tell me about just what that is and what you look at when you're looking at infrastructure projects. You smiled, so I smiled back. I mean, the returns are, are compelling, and we've had to apologize for that. Um, you know, in 1995, when, when I was fortunate enough to be hired to come to Regina, Saskatchewan, to, to be one of the team building our real estate solution, our mortgage solution, um, we convinced our board that our clients would benefit from our expertise in, in global infrastructure. We hired a lead who was culturally aligned. We embarked on our first investments. Uh, Silicon Ranch, uh, the first investment, uh, a U.S. solar platform, uh, has exponentially exceeded our, our expectations and therefore the returns. Uh, the four-year return has that outside return, but it also has a diversifying nature of the additional assets we're including in the portfolio and growing the portfolio. So if you look at those returns and we go back to that slide you showed earlier about expected outcomes, the expected return for in infrastructure in a total return basis with an income-oriented profile and the use of financing, because the covenants are so strong and long in nature, um, these returns will be high single digit, low double digit in, in our assessment. Very accretive and interesting returns uh, as a third alternative in a diversified alternative solution. What role does that diversified income stream you just talked about play in where we are in the economic cycle? Because it's a pretty interesting time right now. I, I would say, you know, when, when you look at, at, at the headline numbers of, of negative yield environments, when, when uh, we look at the, the global situation, we look at Trump, all those dynamics, um, are we going to see the return expectations for these alternatives to come down? And um, I'm not afraid of that, um, if that's the reality of what's appropriate on a risk-adjusted basis. What, what I would say is, as we conduct ourselves in the market, we have to be incredibly cognizant of the risk we're taking on when we're buying a less liquid asset. So what, what is our growth assumption? Have we measured it correctly if all this fiscal stimulus is not providing the outcome that's expected and we do see a re recessionary environment? So how have we assessed the, the, the value of those covenant and income streams on the downside? So, so um, it's a massive uh, open-ended question and I think I would come to it and say we fight from a bottom up on every asset we consider introducing the portfolio. Is it worthy on an absolute basis, on a risk-adjusted basis, 
on an economic basis, on a geopolitical basis, all those things have to be considered to determine whether a particular asset is worthy to come in to the portfolio, and we assess that all the time. Ted, thanks very much. Thanks. That was Ted Welter, Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer uh, of Alternative Investments at TD Greystone Asset Management. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and we do hope to see you again next week.